being close friends with somebody for almost all of your life usually builds a solid foundation of trust. But this tragic case is what happens when a so-called friend takes advantage of that trust and abuses it in the most despicable way possible. Before I start today's video, just a quick 30 seconds to thank today's sponsor Wicked Clothes who have been a great help to this channel and supporting true crime on YouTube. If you haven't heard of them already, they make some seriously awesome and creative designs like these ones here. These are some of my absolute favourite designs. I have an order on the way so expect to see some pictures of me proudly wrapping their clothes soon. Their stuff is incredibly reasonably priced and if you see anything you like, you can use Disturbin in the coupon section for a further 10% off. Or you can click the link below in the description and it should automatically do it for you. So check them out if you're a fan of true crime or horror, as I'm sure there'll be something for you there. And now, on to the video. This case takes place on the 19th of September 2019. Keely Bunker was a 20 year old woman from Tamworth, England. On this day, Keely was celebrating her birthday, which was actually 12 days earlier. She had gotten some tickets to see the rapper H at the Birmingham O2 Academy. She had gone with a friend called Monique Riggan, and after the concert was over, they had made plans to meet with a man named Wesley Street, and a few other people. Wesley was a 20 year old man and he and Keeley had been friends since childhood, and the two of them were close. They headed to a nightclub called Snobs, and here we can see the videos showing Keeley smiling and having fun. And here you can see Wesley. After the night was over, the three friends took a taxi to Monique's home. As the three of them stood outside the house at around 4am, Monique offered for Keely to stay the night, so she didn't have to walk home so late. Keely only lived around 20 minutes away, so it wasn't too far. Plus, she had an important job interview for a teacher's assistant position the next day at around 2pm. Keely thanked her friend for the offer, but declined, as she wanted to sleep in her own bed in preparation for this interview the following day. Wesley was going to be walking in near enough the same direction as Keeley, so he offered to walk her back. And of course, they had known each other from childhood, so Keeley trusted him. Monique told them both to be careful, to which Keeley replied, I've got Wes. Wes will walk me back. It'll be fine. This would be the last time Monique would ever get to speak to her friend again. Keely never made it to the interview. This of course greatly concerned her friends and family, as this interview meant a lot to her. Keely's dream was to be able to work with children, so this interview was very important. They called her multiple times, but there was no answer. By 5pm on the 19th of September, Keely was reported missing by her parents, and a search soon began to find her, which involved friends, family, and the police. Wesley was the last person to see her, so they quickly contacted him in hopes he would be able to piece together what happened before she disappeared. Wesley said he was rather intoxicated, but that he remembered that they both made it to a phone box near where he was staying that night. He said when they got to this phone box, they parted ways, and that this was the last time he saw her. The police asked him if he would cooperate in piecing together their walk home, so at around 7pm, Wesley got into a police car with some officers to show them the route that he took. The police became suspicious of Wesley, and they asked him if they would be able to see his phone. This appeared to make him panic, and he refused to cooperate. But while Wesley was with the police, Keeley's family were still searching for her. A blood-curdling scream was then heard by some of the search team. The scream belonged to that of Keeley's uncle, who was also looking for her. He had found the lifeless body of his niece at 9pm. She was face down in a pond in Wigington Park. Her underwear was down to her ankles, and she had been strangled and left for dead. Whoever had done this to her had forced themselves upon her, ended her life, and attempted to cover her body with branches. The uncle managed to spot her 
as his flashlight just so happened to catch a glint of a bracelet on her arm. And then he saw hair. He knew instantly it was Keeley. The Staffordshire Police also released this footage of Wesley in the back of the police van, where they informed him they had found the body of Keeley and that he was now under arrest. It's not. It's not what you want is to be back in the police car. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm getting the blame. No, no, no one's no, blaming no, you. Just, no, me, me, no, me, me, you, me. No, but you said when I was at the house that all I needed to do was speak to the officer, and then I could go and look for Ke then, then I could go and look for Keely, and then you take my phone but off. But as um, as my colleague said at the minute, you know we there's a lot of people involved yeah. in what's happening, of which we are PCs and there are people are a lot higher yeah. up than us who are making decisions yeah. and, well, I, just, I don't, yeah. what, I don't well, now when you say you take, you're going to take my phone now I feel like you're blaming me no, we, we haven't we haven't blamed mate no, 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 we no, haven't no, we haven't we haven't once since we've been sat in this car I think, I think your dad can vouch we haven't once blamed you for anything all we've done we've been told by our bosses yeah. that we need to take, take us on the no no to take on the scene yeah. uh, to, this, you know where it's gone the route um, so have a have a drive of the route yeah. Um, and then, and we are literally just following those instructions. And I know you've got a lot of questions, and I know you, you know, your parents have probably got a lot of questions. But and I think it's obvious, you know, we it's obvious when I say that we've been with you, so I can't answer those questions because we've been sat in the car. Yeah. Yeah. That, they are. Right. Wesley, you yeah. need to listen to me. Right. It's moment of time. You're under arrest for suspicion of murder. Okay, you don't have to say anything. It may harm your defence if you mention my questions in relation to court. Anything you do say may be given evidence, okay? So we're going to take you to a police station now, all right, and we'll sort everything else there. All right, okay. My colleague's here, I'm just going to stay with, you, with, with your mum and dad. All right, just, just to get them safe. All right. Um, are you able to scoot over, mate? Is that all right? Because I'll, I'll sit next to you, I'll sit here. All right. You can grab your dad's cable, if I can. Put your seatbelt on, mate, and I'll, I'll sit next to you in a minute. Okay. That's Dad's phone charger. Dad's phone charger. Yeah. Yeah. We, we're going to uh, start moving. You know, just step away from the car for me. So we, we need to go now. Right, we, we, so we need to go now. You just need to come away from the car for me, please. Good. I'll, I'll let the sergeant discuss that with you. All right. Twenty-two, eight, uh, twenty-two, seventeen, twenty-two, seventeen. By myself, two four one eight five received. Then why are mum and dad coming to the station? We'll, we'll sort that. If if they need to, then yeah, by all means. All right. Because right. I find I find it hard to talk. You got you got a pen to hand that? Yes. There you go. That was just too much, wasn't it? Just too much. The investigators knew that Wesley was lying. They managed to use GPS evidence to prove his version of events were false. The GPS on his mobile phone pinged at a nearby tower and showed that he did not go to a telephone box and then go home like he said. Instead, they discovered that he went away from his home and into Wigginton Park where Keeley's body would later be found. There was also CCTV footage discovered that showed Keeley and Wesley at 4.23am walking towards and into the park. The CCTV has not been released as far as I know, but it's reported that it appeared that Keeley was trying to get away from Wesley. They also learned that Wesley was inside the park for around one hour with Keeley. The GPS data that I mentioned previously showed that the phone was at the location several times that day. At first, he denied any involvement, but then he changed his story several times. He said that he was with Keeley in the park when she died, claiming that he jumped on her back in a playful way for a piggyback, causing her to accidentally fall and fatally hit her head 
on the gatepost. The post-mortem showed that this was a lie. They discovered that it was strangulation that was the cause of death. They also found his DNA inside of Keeley's body too. The police now had CCTV, GPS and DNA evidence pointing to Wesley. Once confronted with this new evidence, he then changed his story yet again, stating that he and Keeley were walking through the park when they both began to flirt with one another. The police then confronted him with this CCTV footage showing Keeley trying to get away from him. He told the police that they were merely play fighting. He then said that when they got into the park, they began to kiss, which led to them having consensual sex inside the park, and that he began to choke her with his arm from behind while they were having sex, and that in the moment he got carried away and he accidentally choked her, ending her life. He then confessed to dragging her body into the pond and covering her with branches to hide what he had done. Wesley was living fairly close to the park and he got back at around 6.20 a.m. He remained there for around four hours. He then went back to the location where he had dumped Keeley's body to cover her with more branches and he repeated this several times throughout the day. When he was asked why he had initially lied about these claims, he said that he didn't know how to explain to other people how she died because he felt embarrassed and scared to admit what had happened to the police and to the friends and family of Keeley. During the trial, he told the court that he started to panic after Keeley's body went floppy. Once she did, he said that he checked her pulse and then when he didn't feel anything, he then dragged her body into the pond. When asked why he never contacted the emergency services for assistance when she lost consciousness, he said it just didn't enter his head to do so. He then said that the last time he stood there after covering her body, he thought to himself, why me? And that he didn't mean for this to happen, which in my opinion is a strange admission to how little he thought about Keeley and how he only thought of himself. A number of people came forward and told the investigators that they spotted Wesley in the location where Keeley's body would later be found at around 10.30 a.m., which is around the time when he would have returned to add more branches to cover her body. The prosecution team didn't believe a word that Wesley said, as he had already lied multiple times. Keeley was also found to have self-inflicted scratch marks on her neck, and these scratch marks would have been from when she panicked and tried to desperately prize herself from the chokehold. The police also found a top that was worn by Wesley on the 18th and 19th of September that contained a number of bloodstains. And these bloodstains were found to match the DNA of Keeley. And not only that, on the sleeve of this top, there was makeup that she was wearing that night and traces of her saliva. The prosecution team theorized that Keeley saw Wesley as just a friend, but Wesley wanted more, and that he attempted to make a move that night, but got rejected and refused to take no for an answer. It was this rejection that hurt his ego and fueled this disturbing crime. They also made the point that Wesley wasn't faced at all by taking her life, as after taking Keeley's life, he went home and slept before returning later on to cover her up some more. Also, to take somebody's life by choking requires you to choke them past the point of them being unconscious. Usually, it takes minutes for somebody to die from strangulation. So his entire story made no sense and it was clear that he was continuing to lie about what really happened in the early hours of that morning. Soon enough, other women found the courage to come forward and speak about their experiences with Wesley. He was accused by three other women and found guilty of seven counts of SA. These offences took place in 2015, 2017 and 2019. Wesley was also found guilty of murdering Keeley and he was sentenced to life with a minimum sentence of 29 years and 46 days in prison. An all too common theme in the crimes I research involve a breach of trust from someone close to the victim. I remember when I first learned that when somebody is murdered, 
it's likely that the perpetrator is someone close to the victim. It left me shocked and it's one of those depressing realities of life to know that there are people like Wesley out there who can and will use the trust they have built with you to then abuse it so they can do unspeakable things to you.